You know, we should have never had that argument that we had last week. Yeah, you're right. We shouldn't have never took it that far. You know, I've been reading in the Bible here lately. And over in Ephesians, it says that wives are to submit to their husbands. Ha! Huh. Submit, please! That's what it says. That means me, Tarzan, and you, Jane. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't. I know you just didn't say me, Tarzan, you, Jane. That is not what the Bible said. That's what it said. Oh, no. See, my understanding of Ephesians says husbands are supposed to love their wives just like Jesus would. Like Jesus would? That's right. Jesus don't live with you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what you need to do is submit. You know what I mean? Submit. Oh, I'll submit to you, all right. I'll submit to you that if you don't get a better understanding of what that Bible says, it's going to be time for round two. Okay, 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 okay. Maybe we both need a little better understanding about what the Bible says. You're probably right. We probably need to get in there and listen to what Pastor has to say. <laughs> Before we get to round two, let's go to the book of Ephesians. And uh, I want you to stand with me for the reading of the word. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 5. I want to read verse 22 and 23. This is a critical time in our nation's history. And, uh, you know, there's those of you that are watching live feed. We welcome you. We welcome our Internet churches. Those of you that are watching by television, we welcome you. And our radio audience, we welcome you. To all of you that are here, we, we bless you. God is continuing to grow this church. We're so thankful. And Look at your neighbor and say, Today, today's going to hurt your feelings. Go ahead and tell them. <laughs> and um, what, I, what I want you to do is understand. Let's get something right here on the floor. I am an equal opportunity offender. And uh, if you're here, I will get you today. Not intentionally, all in the love of Jesus. But I am telling you there's some things that a lot of us don't know. And if you do know, then it's great. And you can just smile and shout amen. In fact, if you're doing what I'm preaching, you ought to be saying amen, hallelujah, right ladies? And guys, if you're, if you're being the kind of man of God you're supposed to be, you ought to be shouting amen, right guys? I do not want anybody to be so injured in the side that they need medical attention from the ribbing that they may get. So just be careful. Look with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. Everybody say everything. Can I hear it from this side, everything? Can I hear it from the balcony? I mean all the balconies. Okay, just want to make sure you're there with us. Amen. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see to it she respects her husband. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God, and I pray right now, Jesus, that you would anoint me to speak the words that you've given us to share with this body. I bind every principality and power and ruler of darkness in wicked places. And God, I ask right now that you would make my mouth as the pen of a ready writer. And Father, that you would let there be an anointing on all of our hearts and our minds to receive the word of God and walk in it. And we'll be careful to give you praise for it. And everybody that wants a great marriage, shout it, amen. amen. You may be seated. 
You know, one of the hardest things I do, beloved, as a pastor, shepherd, is to sit with people who are having difficulties in their home or in their marriages. Um, I have been, I've been very, very blessed to have a, a wonderful 30-year marriage with my beloved bride. I'd like to tell you that a lot of that has to do with me, but uh, the reality is a lot of that has to do with our relationship with the Lord. I found out that as I start, stay close to Jesus, the Holy Spirit will convict me if I'm wrong. I shouldn't say if, when I'm wrong. And I found out that as long as my wife walks close to the Lord, which she does, that the Spirit of the Lord talks to her as well. And you know, as, as, as Pentecostal charismatic believers, as people of faith, we all see the, the difficulties and the dysfunctions that our culture today has laid down to us. Um, as a, because I'm a pastor and I'm a shepherd, I want you to win in every area of your life. I don't want you to lose in the area with your children. I don't want you to lose in the area of your family. I want you to win. But very few times when people are going through divorce, very few times, if they're not careful, do we see win-win situations. In fact, I, I've never seen a win-win situation in a divorce. I've seen win-lose. I've seen lose-lose. I just don't see win-win. And before we go any further, let me say to those of you listening, those of you in this room, if you've been through a divorce or something has happened in your life, we can't undo that. That's in the past. But I, I've got to talk to you about your present and your future. And I've got to let you know as a shepherd some of the things that are critical in your walk and in your faith with the Lord. The only way to truly save a marriage is when two people come and they sit down with me or a counselor and both of them want to fix it. If just one of them wants to fix it, about an 80% chance failure rate is going to happen. You say, why is that, Pastor? Because in my experience... I've seen where, where couples have come in, and usually, usually it's something, I'll give you a, a pretty common scenario. The guy's been messing up, the guy's been doing things he shouldn't have, the husband. Finally, the wife gets tired of it, and she says, I'm gonna, I want a divorce. And all of a sudden, it clicks in his mind, he better do something to change. So he drags her into my office, and he says, I'm willing to do whatever. She says, I don't know if I want to do it right now, because she is emotionally spent. So the first thing we got to do is somehow allow her to open up to the Holy Spirit to where all the hurt and all the pain that she's just experienced in her marriage and in her life can be healed by the Holy Spirit. If she's not going to do that, then there's a good chance the marriage is not going to get saved. Then there's the other scenario when we get her to open up, but he is being such a knothead, he keeps going back and doing things. And finally, uh, when she opens up, he's, he's not open. And so... When both couples come in, or both individuals come in, the husband and the wife, and they're both really wanting the marriage to be healed, even though they're angry, even though they're hurt, even though things have happened, there may be adultery, there may be some other things that have taken place, but when they both want it to happen, then 97 to 98% of the time, there can be healing. And I want to say something to you, church. You may not like what I'm about to tell you. But there are such things as innocent parties in divorce. And there's a lot of people that I know that are in our fellowship that have suffered that tragedy that they didn't want it to happen. In fact, they did everything they could to keep it from happening. But it takes two people. Before we get to that point of you coming and seeing me in my office and sitting in my office and going through all those hoops or see seeing someone else or going through that, there's such a thing as preventive maintenance. I went in and I got my physical this week, and uh, I, I went in, I thought, man, I, probably this and this, and, and I got such a clean bill of health that I went out and ate all the bad foods for one day. <laughs> I, I was so excited about this clean bill of health they gave me. So now I'm back on that diet and trying to be good again. But what I'm telling you is, is that you go and get a physical because... You want to be sure you catch something before it gets too serious. 
And the older you get, they start telling you, you need this test, this test, and this test. And it's, they want you to do the test so that it's preventive maintenance. And so this morning, I want to give some preventive maintenance. Tonight, I'll finish with some of the preventive maintenance. But I, I want to give you some things that, that have happened that may help you. I believe a major role in divorce is the lack of the understanding of biblical roles. And today I want to share with you what the Word of God has to say about this and how that you and I as husbands and wives are supposed to operate. You've got to know that the divorce rates in the United States of America are this. For everyone that gets married, if there's two couples that get married, one of those couples will end in divorce. The second marriage divorce rate goes from 60% to 90%. And that rate varies based upon what's been in your background. What happens to those that have an affair in their marriage and their affairs end because that marriage? Or because their marriages end because of the affair? Let me share with you a statistic. This is not statistics coming from a church-related group. These are government statistics of polls. That should you have an affair that ends your marriage... 97 to 98% of the time, the person that you had the affair with, you will not be with. You will just have someone who has destroyed your home, and you will not be with them again. And the concept is when someone has an affair or has an adulterous relationship, that they're so in love with this person that they want to spend the rest of their lives. That's just a plain lie. Anybody that will have an affair with you will cheat with you before you're married. They'll cheat with you during the time you get married. And somehow during the time, people come to that agreement. So my thing is to tell you that God wants you and I to remain monogamous in our marriages. There's no cheating. I said there's no cheating. And I want to say something to you, and I want you to hear something, because it's a problem. It's a problem with men and women. And I'm not just throwing statistics out, and I don't want to just be negative, but I want you to hear I'm your pastor. And I love you, and I, I, I don't want you to go down this road. But guys, listen to me. If you are watching pornography, you are committing adultery on your wife. Jesus said, if you think it in your heart, it's as though you've done it. That's what Jesus said. He talked about watching the eye gate. And ladies, same goes for you. Somebody once said, and, and I, I don't mean to be crass, but I need, I need you to understand some, some, some things because some of you are thinking people ought to know that, Pastor. You don't need to say that. I'm prefacing my remarks because I want you to know that people don't know these things. The things that you thought people knew or took for granted, they don't. They don't. The culture that we live in today is so different than what many of you grew up in that the right and the wrongs and the, the moral values that you and I thought that everybody knows, they don't know today. So I want to say this without being too graphic. There is, there is no place even in your marital bedroom for you to be watching pornography. I want you to understand that. To do that is sin. You don't bring anybody else into that sexual relationship but your spouse. No one else, no more pictures, no videos, nothing. And to do that is wrong and it's sin. You need to know that. 65% of all altar-bound men and women live together before they get married according to Brides Magazines. And because of that, people who live together are more likely to have their marriages end in divorce by two times. So if you're thinking this morning that I'm just going to go ahead and try it out to see what it's like, it's not going to work that way either. You see, God said this. He said, marriage is a sacred covenant, and the sexual relationship is prohibited until we enter into marriage. Then when you're in marriage, God simply says, go to it. Have fun. The marriage bed is undefiled. It's great. God created sex. And when, when it's done in the marriage bed, there is no guilt, there's no shame. It's a positive thing for all of us. But when it's done outside 
of the marriage bed, it creates perversion and guilt and things that never need to happen. Children of divorce have a higher risk of divorce when they marry and an even higher risk if the person they marry comes from a divorced home. Why is that? Because when you have seen a trust broken between your parents, it's very hard to get over that. Now, how do, how do, what happens when your kids see stuff like that? How do you get over that? You get over that by, by engaging them in the power and presence of Jesus Christ. Because only Jesus can heal the wounds of divorce. Nobody else can. We have great Christian counselors and we have great Christian psychologists in this church, men and women that are committed to their profession, but they will tell you that the most success they have is when people take the word of God and they operate in it. And I want you to understand that there's healing and forgiveness at the cross of Christ. Can you say amen? According to George Barna, 35% of all born-again Christians in America have experienced divorce, and most of those people, 75% of them, have experienced a divorce a second time. 46% of all weddings in the U.S. today are remarriages for at least one partner. Most of these marriages include children from previous relationships. Approximately 30% of all weddings in the U.S. give birth to a step family. And now we know that without intervention, 60 to 70% will end in legal divorce. And I've got a statistic that I Googled this week that I want to give to you that is shocking to me. I'm not throwing stones. And I understand. Listen to me. 50% of this church has experienced divorce and remarriage. Your pastor's not throwing stones. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I am trying to share with you some things that will help you in the future. But I want you to understand that in 2010, for the first time in American history, the majority of families in America are step families. By that I mean there's stepchildren or step parents involved in it. This means that there's more step families than single parent or traditional first families right now in America today. That is where the culture has come. Now, if I ask for a raise of hands, then how many of you would tell me how hurtful divorce was? If you've ever experienced divorce, your hands would go up. And some of you right now are saying, Pastor, you're not even scratching the surface of how hurtful this is. It has wounded me. It has hurt me. It's broken me. It's hurt my family. I've, I deal with things. And, and what, what has hurt so much with families that have been broken is during the holiday season. It's hard. It's, it's difficult. And all these things. So I'm trying to be sensitive in everything I'm saying to you. And I want you to know as your pastor, I, I feel for that. And it angers me when, when people who sit in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and they somehow can tune out the word and say they can go do their own thing. And I, it, I had this said to me and I, it was just so appalling and it angered me. Somebody actually came to me and said, I know God wants me to get a divorce. I know it's the will of God for, no, it's the will of God for your marriage to be healed. Do you hear me? It is the will of God. But sometimes, some people don't want that to happen. It takes two to create the miracle. And there are times that that doesn't happen. I want us to look at what a marriage was designed to be like because you know what I found out? Most of us don't know what marriage is supposed to be like. Jelly had a view of marriage. I had a view of marriage. Thankfully, we both loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And thankfully, both of us had a deep relationship with Christ. And thankfully, we both put Jesus first. So when I would get out of line in my attitude, the Holy Spirit would convict me. And the one or two times that she wasn't as perfect as she normally is, the Holy Spirit would nudge her. I'm being very careful this morning. I'm just saying to you that there's a reason why we have the difficulty. Look with me and notice the guidelines and instructions for wives. And I'm going to hurry. But ladies... I'm going after you this morning. Guys, just wrap your arm around her and say, honey, it'll be all right. 
but I'm, I'm talking to you this morning. And tonight, guys, it's you and me. And ladies, if you're smart, you'll have him here. And even if he doesn't want to come, come, take notes, and get the CD and the DVD. <laughs> do whatever you need to do and get them here. All right, here we go. Guidelines for wives. Number one, the declaration, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Oh, what a word, submit. The word submit doesn't mean doormat. When a woman submits to the Lord, it is her service is unto the Lord. Ladies, you are not a doormat because you submit to your husband. It is not like that at all. I want you to understand that when you submit to your husband, that doesn't make you less of what God would have for you. It is simply submitting and doing the things that God would have you and I to do. Now, how many of you have ever been wronged by someone? And some of you ladies would say to me, Pastor, my husband doesn't have as much enough sense sometimes to get out of the rain or to put an umbrella. Ladies, don't ever say that about your husbands. You know what that means? What does that say about you? You married them. I mean... You ought to be saying, I've got the most fantastic, gorgeous, sharp-looking guy in the world. The young wives are saying, amen. Where's you older wives? <laughs> How many of you have been married 10 years? Raise your hand, ladies. You've been married 10 years. Raise your hand. 10 years or more. Raise your hand. 10 years or more. All right. I'm going to give you a chance. Ladies, when you talk about your husbands, you ought to be saying, I've got the most gorgeous, sharp, brilliant man that God put on the face of the earth. Still weak in that balcony. I don't know about. <laughs> and over here, I'm not hearing a word. I know I need to concentrate right over here. There's a problem or something. I don't know. I'm not hearing. But listen to me. When you have a difficulty and your husband doesn't do what he needs to do or there's something he, he is doing wrong in your marriage, the answer is not to rebel. The answer is to submit that to the Lord. Listen to me. If he doesn't treat you right, he'll answer to God as long as you keep your attitude right. But you get your attitude wrong, then God's going to have to deal with you before he can deal with him. Why not keep a good spirit so God can just sick them? <laughs> that it's just the Lord dealing with him. You know, I told you a funny story last week about my situation. I learned quickly that God loves girls. He loves girls. And guys... If you're not kind to your wives, God said he's not even going to listen to what you have to say. So that's the declaration. Secondly, the definition, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Notice with me, the kingdom of God has order. Say amen to that. Let me say it again. The kingdom of God has order. God created the order. And when, beloved, you and I don't function in the order that God created us to function in, then things are going to get out of whack and things aren't going to be right. God said the husband is to be the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Now, I'll preach about how husbands are supposed to act tonight. But ladies, if you are not going to submit to your husband, then the whole thing is out of order. I told the early service that I was engaged to be married when I was 16 and a half years old. Crazy, but I was. And I broke it up for one reason. I watched my fiance's mother browbeat her husband of almost 35 years. 30, I, I mean, I'm just telling you, she was amazing. She could tear you down, call him dumb, said it was stupid, all this kind of stuff. And I started having arguments 
with him. Not with him, but with her. He was a great guy. Fun loving, but she, she just would go to the roof real quick. And I was smart enough to realize that if her mother was like that, there was a good chance she was going to be like that. And I knew, knowing me and my gentle personality, that there would either be a divorce or a murder within two years. Because somebody was going to have to get relief. So I walked away from that, and I'm so glad I did. I was going to say something, but I'm not going to be that crass. But anyway, God told us how to have a marriage relationship. And ladies, when you try to lead your husbands, now listen, before we go any further, the wives are a helpmate, okay? Say helpmate. And a kingdom has order. A wise king has counselors around him, doesn't he? And a really smart king has special counselors around him that speak into his life, right? That's the same way in the kingdom of God. And if you're a husband and you don't take your wife's opinion into uh, the aspect or the equation of settling an issue in your life or direction, you're not real smart. And you're going to make some unusual mistakes. Now, I want to tell you that the way my wife loved me into including, because I'm, unfortunately, when we got married, what they did here, me, Tarzan, you, Jane, I sat in church enough and heard enough about submission. I didn't hear the whole thing because I would just like some of you this morning that when you heard me say submission, you're turning the rest of it out. You're not listening to everything else I'm saying, guys. You're just saying, submit, submit. That means I get to have sex anytime I want to. And that's where you're at right now. Come back into the conversation. <laughs> Come back here. And some of you are going to say, I don't need to come tomorrow. And I don't need to come tonight because I already know what I'm supposed to do. No, you don't. Because the very fact that you're saying that tells me you don't know. You don't have a clue. Now listen to me. First couple times, I made decisions that were critical. Thankfully, they weren't life-altering, but they had to deal with finances. And I, I, I've always handled the finances in our home. I feel good about it. I've been good about that. And... I was getting ready to make a decision. My wife said to me, I, it was about loaning money to someone, and I said, I don't think we ought to do that. And I said, why? She said, we aren't their source, God is. And if you loan them that money, and we didn't have the money to loan, we had, it was on a credit card. It was a person in the church, the first church I pastored. The church wasn't very big, about 100 people, and, and he employed six people of the church, and Six families unemployed in your church and church of 100. And I thought, you know, I'm doing a good thing. I'm helping these families and everything. And she said, honey, I'm just telling you, I don't think it's a good thing. And I went ahead and did it. And this guy was supposed to pay me back in two months with the interest. It was 18 months with no interest. And she never said to me, ladies, I told you so. She never said to me, ladies, you should have listened. She never did that. She's a smart lady. Second time, I figured, now I'm not a fast learner, so I figured she got it right one time. She got lucky. I mean, she really, she really wasn't hearing from God. She got lucky, so I'm gonna make, I, I, we had this other thing come up, and I was going to make this decision again. She said to me, she said, babe, I really feel a check in my spirit. I don't think we should do this, but if you want to do it, go ahead. I'm just telling you I feel a check. So I said, well, you know, I feel good about it. And she said, well, I'm just telling you I feel a check. If you want to do it, go ahead. So I went and did it. She was right again. So I want to tell you something, guys. I don't make any major decisions unless she and I are united in it. You know what the Bible says? The two shall become one flesh. That does not just simply mean the act of sexual intimacy. It means that both of us come together 
and have one purpose and one mind. And if any of us has a check in our spirit, it may be that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your partner to protect you from something happening, and you better listen. Now, if you keep running through those roadblocks, you're going to get hurt. That's how my wife taught me about partnership. She submitted to me, but she was right. And, and as the high priest of my house, the most valuable asset I have in my life, aside from salvation, is jelly. There is no other more valuable asset in my life than her. She is the most trusted confidant in my life. And gentlemen, if you don't treat your wives that way, you are missing something in your relationship. You, and ladies, he can't treat you that way if you're not submitting. You think I'm going to go to Jelly and ask her what she thinks if she's always telling me, I told you, you ain't, you ain't got the common sense to get out of this. You, you're so stupid. And if she's berating me, I'm not talking. Hey, men, we're stubborn. We may not be right, but we're stubborn, ladies. And we'll buck up to you. It, it may cost us our heads getting cut off, but if we don't, we don't have to be smart to be stubborn. You know that. So love us. Submit. And in, in your submission, you create some. Finally, as our musicians come, we've looked at the declaration, the definition. Look at the implications. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. How many of you ever seen a church that's not subject to Christ? Oh, they have, they have a name on the outside. They have a statement of doctor, doctor, doctrinal truths. They have all the right things. But the pastor's not submitted to Christ, or the church board's not submitted to Christ, or the church itself is not submitted to Christ. You see it all the time. You've got people standing in pulpits today that are practicing homosexuals or lesbians or people standing in pulpits today that are committing adultery or fornication, and, and then they, things happen in, in the body and nothing's corrected and because God's not the head of the church. And when you see that, you see a dysfunctional church. But when the church is submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ, then you see people being saved, lives being changed, the church grows, and value is added, and people change their culture. And in the same way, ladies and gentlemen, when a, when a wife is not in order biblically, you send messages that you don't want to send. You see, you can't submit to a spouse unless you're submitted to Christ. Let me say that, ladies. You will never submit to your husbands one iota more than you're submitted to your relationship with Jesus Christ. And guys, I'm not trying to be offensive to you, but listen to me. You're not real smart when you keep your wives out of church. And listen to me, those of you watching at home right now, you fuss at your wives for coming to church. You're, you're about as dumb as you get. You're not real smart at all. Even if you're not born again, you ought to, have, you ought to want your wife in church. Because the more she loves God, the more she's going to be able to love you and submit to you. And guys, I'm telling you, the secret to my relationship with Jelly is that she loves Jesus Christ. And because she loves Jesus Christ and she submits to Christ... She doesn't have a hard time submitting to me. And I want to tell you something else. I take great comfort in knowing. Every day she has her Bible study. Not because she's a preacher's wife. Not because I tell her to. She does it because she loves Jesus. I've never had to tell her in 30 years, do you read your Bible? Because it's so evident. It's out there every morning. I'll walk in sometimes and she's got her Bible open. She's reading it. She'll come to me and say, this is what the Lord said to me. There's always that expression of what God is doing in her life. And I want you to understand, ladies, there's a reason why some of you can't submit. And you may say it's your husband. It is not your husband. It is your relationship with Jesus. You will never submit to your husband more than you submit to Christ. And when we have Holy Ghost, Pentecostal, 
spirit-filled women that are in love with Jesus, you're going to have men walking around like this all the time, not because of some pill, but because they love Jesus Christ. <laughs> Did I just say that? <laughs> Must be anointed this morning, amen. <laughs> Ladies, when you submit, we were, we were leaving as they begin to play softly. We were leaving yesterday. We, we got up to the hospital and uh, got to hold Jaylee. I'm telling you, I am ruined. I am just ruined. I'm going to be one of those grandpas that everybody made fun of. That's what, I know it. I'm smitten with that little girl. I just held her and loved her. And it was just, I mean, I'm thinking, man, Jordan's over there and she's recovering and I'm, you okay? And uh, how you doing, Jaylee? <laughs> when, when Jaylee is first born, you know, I hadn't seen her yet. And then they're telling me I'm going to get to go and see her. And I'm standing around and I'm in the middle of this uh, hospital and they got this gift shop there and I'm looking and I see a pink teddy bear and I the other grandparents aren't there yet and I think mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna get her a pink teddy bear then I'm walking through the through the thing and I start pulling this and pulling this and I had some cash with me and I realized that wasn't gonna be enough so I put it in pulled the credit card out <laughs> and I just started pulling things and I walked in there, and I had all this stuff for my grandbabies. I had my little pin. I'm a proud grandpa and all that stuff on it. And I, I walked in, and I gave it all, and I didn't get a thing for Jordan and Chris. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I mean, it was just, you just kind of forget about them, you know? And... um you know, I, I found myself going in, and we were talking about going to see the baby, and I walked in, and I, and I walked into the room, and I said, where's Shaylee? And he, Chris said, well, they just took her out. They'll bring her back. I said, how long is she going to be gone? I didn't say hi to him or anything. I mean, I, I had to catch myself. So we're done, and we're leaving. We're walking out. We kiss Shaylee goodbye and give Chris and Jordan a hug, and we're walking down the down the hospital corridor to our car. And I, I look at her, and I say, man, this is great. She said, uh, what, being a grandpa? And I said, well, we get to love this baby, kiss this baby, spoil this baby, and then we get to go home and sleep all night while they deal with everything else. This is great. And I looked at her, and I said, uh, Chris owes you a lot. Chris loves his mother-in-law. There's a reason. Because she's modeled something for those girls to live up to. Now, whether they do or not, that's up to them. But she's modeled something that they have to live up to. And what I'm saying to you ladies, the Scripture says you can live your life in such a way that you can love that hellion that you call a husband into the kingdom. It really does. And that person that you think is so unreachable, you can do that through God's help. Well, what if they won't listen to me? Just do your part. You do your part. God will take care of the rest. And I want to tell you that if you'll do your part, God will always provide for you, no matter what your husband does. God will provide for you in one way, shape, form, or another because he will take care of you. And today, as we close this service, there are husbands in this house. There are children in this house. There are wives in this house that you're not right with Jesus Christ. You don't, you've never really accepted Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you have, but you're in a backslidden condition. And today, Today is your day. You're feeling it in your heart. That's not me making you feel bad. That's the Spirit of God that's touching you. And ladies, 
Some of you are already saying in your mind, but pastor, you just don't understand. If you let that thought continue in your spirit, the devil will rob you of every bit of revelation that could come into your life and change your marriage and change your home. I want to tell you that Miss Jelly knows how to keep me in line. I am as strong-willed as any individual that you have ever met. You talk about opinionated. I don't know of any man that's more opinionated and strong-willed than I am. I don't say that as a boast. I say that as an error sometimes. But she knows how to control that. She does it through love and grace. And sometimes she'll look at me with those green eyes and get teary and she'll say, that hurt my feelings. That's all she has to say is that hurt my feelings. And that will break my heart because I am a man of God. No matter what else, I am a man of God. And that will break my heart and cause me to get right and say I'm sorry. And gentlemen, if you're going to be a leader, if you're going to lead your home, you've got to lead in the apology department. You can't let her lead in that. You lead. You lead in providing. You lead in loving. But you lead in saying, I'm sorry. If you're not doing that, something is wrong. But ladies, we're men that are little boys grown up. And if you challenge us and you say we can or we won't, most of us have got enough manhood that we'll challenge you back. That's not what God said. Wives, submit yourself as the church submits itself to Christ. I'm, not, I'm the under-shepherd of this church, Jesus. If Jesus tells us to do something, whether I like it or not, we're going to do it. Because it's not my church, it's his church. And ladies... There may be times your spouse asks you to do things you don't like. Submit to him like Christ, like the church does to Christ. And if it's wrong, God will protect you and God will straighten it out. But you'll be in a place to receive blessing. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love, for the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask now that you would minister to us and to every individual that's in this house, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you will do a sign and a wonder and miracle. And God, I ask right now that miracles will happen in each life. Father, I pray right now that as we take this next step in our commitments with you, that we'll not be afraid of what you're going to do in our lives. So our heads are bowed. I want to see the hands of those that would raise your hand and say, I know I need to get right with God. I am not right with God. Would you pray for me, Pastor? I'm in a lost condition or a backslidden condition, I don't have Jesus in my heart. Or if Jesus came right now, I don't think I'd make heaven. Would you pray for me? If that's you, slip your hand up right now in the main floor in the balcony and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not right with God. Thank you. Anyone else? Quickly. Slip it up high and put it down. Thank you. Anyone else? Quickly. Slip it up high. I'm not right with God. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm not right with God, Pastor. Pray for me. Thank you. I'm not right with God, Pastor. Pray for me. Thank you. Anyone else? Quickly. Come on, sir. Come on, ma'am. This is not the time. I want to tell you that you've been given grace this morning. Don't let it, don't let it leave. Anyone else? Quickly. Those of you that raise your hands, look at me. Our altar workers are getting ready to come. If you raise your hand, I want you to get up out of your seat and come and kneel at this altar. Don't wait on anybody. Just come right now. You say, what will people think? It doesn't matter. This is between you and God. Be man or woman enough to do what you said and make things right with God. Get up and come right now. Come on. I need the altar workers to come quickly as they're coming. Just get up right now and come real quickly all over this place. Quickly come. Just keep coming. Just find yourself a place of prayer right in this altar. Quickly. Just keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. I want everybody in this house, would you stand with me quickly? Tonight, guys, I will help you. 
it, it may hurt a little bit, but I will help you tonight. And ladies, you say, well, I'm single. I don't even want to get married. Well, come and listen for somebody who is married because they're going to need it. They're going to need the advice, I promise you. Now, ladies, I'm going to ask you to do something. All the ladies in the house, from the very top balconies to the main floor, would you come and gather here? I just want to pray over you real quickly. Just get out of your seats and come. Sing it. You're the lover of my soul. Jesus. Come as close as you can, ladies. Come as close as you can. You've taken me from the miry clay. You set my feet upon the rock. And now I know that I love you. And I need you. And though my world may fall, I'll never let you. friend I will worship you until the very end Jesus lover of my soul Jesus I will never let you go you've taken me from the miry clay you sent my on the rock and now I know I love you I need you and though my world may fall I'll never let you go my Savior my closest friend I will worship you until the very Ladies, our desire, my desire as your pastor, is for you to have a home that's filled with love and grace and someone that will love you and care for you that you can say and be proud of to say, that's my husband. That he lives and walks according to the word. Now, some of you are standing here and your husbands have gone on and you're widows. But you can say God was good to me because I had a good husband. And that's a wonderful thing as well. Jelly, uh, Jelly has been one of the greatest assets on planet earth besides Jesus. <laughs> and uh, she has, as you can tell, she has never lost her ability to express herself or to say what's right but she does it with grace and dignity and she will conduct herself in, in difficult situations lots of times better than I would and uh, I thank God for that there's, there's things I've learned from her things she's learned from me and we balance each other we complete each other and that's what God wants to do I'm going to ask her to just say one or two things and then she's going to pray over you and ask the Lord to minister to you because you don't have to be a statistic and if you were a statistic you don't have to be a statistic again and I want to tell you that the hurt and the pain that you may be experiencing even this morning can be wiped away by the power of the Holy Spirit Jesus loves you God says, if your husband doesn't treat you well, he said, I'm not listening to one thing he has to say. In fact, Peter says that he, he's not going to hear their prayers. So their husband, your husband has to, if he's got one eye and half cents, treat you right or God's not going to hear his prayer. That's just the, the only thing he's going to hear is when he says, will you forgive me? And then he goes and says, God, will you forgive me? Then he'll begin to hear. Honey. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you 
for this group of precious daughters that you have placed in this building today. Lord, we are sometimes made to think that we are invincible, but Lord, we know in the depths of our spirits, in the depths of our hearts, that we are weak people needing someone to depend on. And Father, I just ask right now that you will help us to embrace the idea that we are not submitted just because we are less, but Lord, we are submitted according to your word. Father, we subject our will to yours. And Father, I ask during this, this next few days, this next few weeks, that you will remind us frequently that though we may want our way and we may want things done our way, that when we submit to you and to, to the um, authority in our lives, you make everything flow so much more smoothly. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would touch these women today to be able to accept the word of God and to receive the word of God rather than the word of mankind and the word of this, this nation which says that they are women and that they can do whatever they want. Lord, we are subjected to you. And Father, I ask that you would walk with us today. Lord, when we are squeezed, I ask that your spirit would flow out of us. And we ask this all in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Ladies, you control more than you realize. I promise. You really do. And, and your husband will never be any greater than the words of your praise. Uh, I, this building would not be here today. I would have not had the courage to finish some things if it wasn't for the words of affirmation from my spouse. I'm telling you, as a leader of leaders, that's my greatest strength and comfort outside Jesus. So you have a big job. Your men will be what you speak into their lives to be. So call them kings one day by faith. They may not be there now, but call them kings. Tell them they can do anything. Believe in them. Encourage them. And watch what God does in your life. So I'm, I'm, we're going to dismiss you and say that you're highly favored among all women. And that you are women of God, women of the Spirit, and that great things are going to store. And has anybody told you how pretty you look today? Well, ladies, you look gorgeous. And if your husband has not told you that, you look him in the eye and say, Pastor said, you need to get smarter. <laughs> All right. Let's sing it. You can be dismissed. If you need prayer, stay around here. We'll pray for you. But we want you to know we love you. Come back tonight. Get that other half. <laughs> You're going to need it. <laughs> <laughs>